Welcome to NWAGC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Wood to introduce our guest. Sure, it's my pleasure to introduce John Scott, who's been one of the leaders in the ECHO telehealth program, and we're going to switch tracks a little bit today from hepatitis C to talk about hepatitis B. John? Great, thanks, uh, Brian, for uh, the opportunity to talk to you guys about HIV and hepatitis B co-infection. Way of introduction, I want to give you an idea of what we're going to talk about in the next 15 minutes. We'll start by just going over the basics of hepatitis B and then move on to epidemiology, testing and monitoring, natural history, and then treatment. So first off, hepatitis B is a partially double-stranded DNA virus. It's not completely double-stranded. And when it replicates, it can sometimes spin off this covalently closed circular or CCC DNA. And this is just akin to the latent reservoir that sometimes we see in, in HIV. The reason why I bring this up is that this is kind of a, a very difficult reservoir to eradicate with our therapy. And so that's why it's like HIV, you can control the viral load, but it's very difficult to um, actually cure. So if you were to stop treatment and a person who's suppressed um, the, the virus, the CCCD DNA would be the reservoir in which that would reseed the, the body. So we can see vertical, horizontal, percutaneous, and sexual spread, and in that way it's very similar to HIV. Uh, a key difference, though, is that you can see di differing severity of disease, or, or what we like to call phases. And then my last point on this slide is that there is indeed a safe and effective vaccine that's been available for almost 20 years and is standard uh, for children in the United States. And so I think it, anyone under the age of 20 has you know, there's a good chance they've been vaccinated, but that a lot of the people we're dealing with, they, they're, you know, 20 or above, and they probably were not vaccinated routinely as a children. So I just wanted to uh, go over the epidemiology of, the, of hepatitis B in the United States. We think there's around 700,000, maybe as many as a million Americans with chronic hepatitis B, as denoted by a positive surface antigen. You're probably closer to 14 million who have um, evidence of exposure, and that's uh, uh, indicated by a positive core antibody. This slide just illustrates that a lot of the um, cases are actually coming from overseas. The, a large number of these people are actually born uh, either in Asia or South America or Africa and then are immigrating. We see about 45,000 new cases of hepatitis B uh, reported annually. And the vast majority of those actually are in the 25 to 45 year old age group, and a lot of those are men. So what about uh, hepatitis B and HIV? And not surprisingly, because there's a shared route of transmission, namely injection drug use, or men have sex with men, there's, there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, so about five to 10% of patients who have HIV also have chronic hepatitis B. I think locally in our clinic, at Madison Clinic, it's around around five to six percent. If you go to other parts of the world, like say Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia, that's much higher. It might be as high as ten to twenty percent. And the thinking there is that a lot of people got Hep B first, and then they get HIV, just because um, Hepatitis B is actually quite uh, quite a bit more contagious. And then the last point I wanted to make is that liver-related disease is a growing cause of death in HIV-positive patients. We talked about this in, in Hep C, but um, also Hepatitis B is a, is a reason for, for death. So um, I'm going to stop right here and, and uh, uh, ask everyone on the network this quiz. And the reason why I want to ask is because a lot of my patients ask me this. And the question is, which is worse? Hepatitis C co-infection or hepatitis B co-infection? There's a little bit of clue here that there, there's something there because we got a p-value of 0.03. So I'll let you think about it. This is where it would be nice to have audience response system. Okay, 50-50 chance. So I actually was really surprised by this study. It was just published in the Clinical Infectious Diseases um, early this year. And it, what it shows is that hepatitis B actually is associated with a higher liver-related mortality. If you look at all-cause mortality, it's uh, not significant. So, um, and that's, that's a look at um, our HIV negative uh, uh, patients um, who have Hep B. There's uh, actually uh, three times more liver related mortality than Hep C. And then if you look at different cohorts, so these are HIV positive um, who were um, originally diagnosed in 1984 through 1996. Um, it's almost twice the liver related mortality. Um, if they're diagnosed in the post, immediate post-heart era, 
Um, there's still a significant trend there. And then starting to see it actually starting to even out a little bit more in the, in the uh, more modern era of um, heart, uh, 2002, 2010. Um, Hep B still leads, but uh, that, that gap is really narrowed. So I, I thought this was an interesting study. It kind of was counterintuitive to what I actually see in my practice. It seems like we'll have a lot more patients who have Hep C and, and are worse off with their HIV. So I, I do feel like I need to go over the serologies because um, it's a, a quite a bit of area of confusion. And so just briefly want to go through this. So the commonly ordered tests with hepatitis B are um, uh, E antigen, E antibody, IgM core antibody, HBV DNA, ALT. So let's go through this, this first case here, uh, which denotes acute hep B. These folks have a positive IgM, they're E antigen, they'll have a very high viral load, and their ALT can sometimes be high, usually it is high. These people are very contagious, and this is, um, would be someone you really want to watch and make sure they don't, they're not um, spreading it. That's a, um, if you were biopsying, they need to have acute inflammation. Now, someone who has chronic Hep B but is immune tolerant, they have um, uh, E antigen, it's positive, they'll have a high viral load, but their body really has not um, recognized the hepatitis B, so there's no inflammation and the ALT is going to be normal. These people are contagious, though, quite contagious because there's a lot of viral, virus circulating. Um, the, the immune active is very similar. The only difference here is that the ALT is high. So this is someone who their body has finally woken up. They've, they've seen the, um, the virus. The immune system has noticed the virus, and it's trying to get rid of it. And this is where, um, if you were to do biopsy, there's chronic inflammation. And in general, these are folks that we want to treat. We want to help the immune system out. Now, uh, chronic hepatitis B that's immune active, sometimes you can um, see this E antigen go away. Um, usually in patients who've had it for a while, the E antigen uh, develops a, a mutation and no, no longer uh, is made. Um, but if you check their viral load, it can be quite high, and the ALT can fluctuate. And in general, these are people we do uh, want to treat as well. And then the last category is someone who's an inactive carrier. Uh, they're negative for IgM, they're negative for E antigen. Um, if you check for surface antigen, it would be positive. They you typically have a very low virus, even undetectable, and have a normal LT. These are folks you would not want to treat. So really, the, it's the uh, folks in the middle category, the immune active, or the immune active with a pre-core mutant that you want to treat. Okay, so how do we monitor these patients um, if they're on therapy? We typically check the HBV DNA just the same amount of frequency as we do with HIV, so every three to six months. And the LFTs, I kind of uh, think, are similar to the CD4 count, so you would want to check your CD4 your CD count every three to six months, same thing with the LFTs. Um, if their E antigen is positive at baseline, then you want to obviously look for that every six months to see if they can seroconvert. And if they're E antigen negative at baseline, then the only really test to monitor for test of cure is the surface antigen. And I usually tip, uh, typically will check that every six to 12 months. Now, if they're not on therapy, um, a good uh, bit of advice is just to follow the LFTs every six months. The reason I say that is people can change their stage. Um, you know, we, that last slide showed, talked about immune active, immune tolerant, and people can flip back and forth um, in between those phases. It's not like a static thing. And the last point I wanted to make is that both patients on therapy and those patients who are not on therapy should have an ultra, ultrasound for liver cancer surveillance, um, especially if uh, they have known cirrhosis um, or they're over the age of 40. So I typically don't um, do an ultrasound if they're under age 40 and um, uh, they don't have known cirrhosis. Okay, what about the natural history? Um, the, you can see that, uh, I guess the key point on this slide is that 30% of people who are in the chronic active phase go on to get cirrhosis, and that's why we're trying to intervene right here. We're trying to prevent that cirrhosis from developing. The other point I wanted to make on this slide is that liver cancer can develop without cirrhosis, a very key difference than with hep C. Um, hep C, uh, you only get liver cancer in the setting of cirrhosis. Um, and that has to do with the HBV DNA, DNA virus being able to incorporate into the hepatocyte and actually cause um, liver cancer de novo. 
The other point I wanted to make is that if a patient has cirrhosis, they have a, a pretty high chance of going on end-stage liver disease, um, so about a 25% chance at that point. Um, so again, uh, if they have cirrhosis, you can still intervene. You can still intervene with an oral uh, nucleoside analog, and sometimes can really reverse these people. Like we call it the Lazarus effect. We've had some of these people who were on the transplant list, and we put them on a really effective oral agent, and they, their synthetic function improves enough that we actually take them off the list. So um, there are lots of uh, good, um, easy-to-take antivirals for, for hepatitis B. And this is typically a, a process like hep C that takes many years, many decades, in fact. And just like with hep C, um, there's some cofactors, alcohol being the probably the most important. So anyone who's got uh, chronic hep C or hep B, you really want to make sure they're not drinking more than two alcoholic beverages a day. That's the kind of the drawing, uh, line where I draw in the sand. Now, uh, the next point I wanted to make is that viral load matters for hepatitis B. And this is a big distinction with hep C. With hep C, the viral load will pretty much stay at a constant level, and it does not affect the natural history. Hepatitis B is different. It's actually more akin to HIV in the way that HIV viral load affects natural history. And this is a large study that came out of, uh, of Taiwan. Um, uh, it was called the REVEAL study. And what they showed is that the initial viral load, so at time zero here, if it was low, uh, like uh, in less than 300, less than 10,000, or less than 100,000, the blue, orange, and blue and purple bars here, they had a lower chance of developing liver cancer or dying from liver disease in the next um, approximately 14 years. So almost 95% uh, of those folks were still alive um, nearly a decade later. However, the folks who had over 100,000 copies per ml of hepatitis B at baseline had a much higher mortality. So after 15 years, uh, about 20% of them died from uh, either liver cancer or liver-related disease. So fortunately, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, drugs in our armamentarium for hepatitis B, and I, I wanted to put that in context with some of these medicines that we might be using for HIV. Um, lamivudine was one of the first agents that was approved for um, for uh, hepatitis B, and it's called actually Epivir HBV. And it's, I just want to point out that the dosage is a little bit lower than what you see with HIV. It's 150 milligrams BID with lamivudine, where hep B is 100. So if you have a co-infected patient, you do want to use a higher dosage. Uh, and it's active against both HIV and hep B. The big problem with lamivudine, if you were just using lamivudine in, in a, a co-infected patient, is that they get a lot of resistance. So as many as 70 to 80% of those patients will have uh, what's called a um, YMDD mutation um, after uh, five years. So we really don't like to use lamivian monotherapy for our hep B patients. Now, adefavir, or hepsera, is active against hep B. We don't think there's much activity against HIV, but I do want to issue a word of caution that it is biochemically very similar to tenofovir. It differs by just one methyl group. Um, so I, I typically don't advise patients to be on adefavir monotherapy if they have HIV. And tecavir is, is um, biochemically similar to lamivudine. Uh, it has a higher barrier to resistance. Um, so it's a great drug for HBV monotherapy. Um, it can have some partial activity against HIV. So again, you don't want to use that um, in a patient uh, who has HIV and have been no other uh, antiretrovirals on board. M. trisidabine or M. triva uh, is active against both HIV and Hep B, um, and it, it can be like lamivudine. You can get resistance to Hep B. Telvivudine, we really don't like to use that much, uh, but it is FDA approved for um, hepatitis B. The main reason we don't like to use it is it causes um, quite a bit of resistance and also can cause CK abnormalities, so uh, myositis. And finally, tenofovir is active against both Hep B and HIV, so it's a, a great two-for-one drug. So on, the, on this list, tenofovir and tecavir tend to be the most potent agents for hep B. Uh, the last thing that's not on this list is uh, pegylated interferon. So uh, that also um, is active only against hepatitis B. So um, these are the, the treatment options for a patient who's co-infected. Um, and I think now with the kind of liberalization of antiretrovirals, we're trying to put almost everyone on Truvada, which is m and tenofovir. Um, so I, I just would highlight, um, you know, this top bar here. If you could put them on um, 
Truvada if, or um, lamivudine plus tenofovir. Okay. So what about the antiviral efficacy? There's a couple things we're following. One is uh, undetectable HPV DNA, loss of E antigen, ALT normalization. The, the three first-line agents, tenofovir and tecovir and, and peganiferin, do really well with viral suppression, but not a whole lot of difference in this next category, loss of E antigen, all around 20 to 30 percent after just one year. And that's really what we're looking at as an endpoint. Um, and the last uh, um, point I want to make is that interferon has a little bit higher uh, surface antigen loss than some of the other agents. So uh, it's being looked at uh, um, in upcoming NIH trials. So I wanted to go over this question that comes up a lot. What do I do with these HPV failures um, or patients who can't take uh, tenofovir? So I just wanted to define what a failure is as someone who's got persistently detectable HPV DNA over 12 months, um, or you see a kind of a bump in their HPV DNA over one log, and it's sustained. Uh, in these cases, I've really uh, resorted to adding in tecovir. Uh, fortunately, I haven't had to uh, give patients interferon, but I do kind of threaten them with it. Um, as, as you remember from the hep C tox, interferon has a lot of side effects, so we really try to only use that in extreme cases. So I just wanted to wrap up with the take-home points. Um, when you're following patients with hepatitis B, the, really the key labs are the ALT and the HBV DNA level, similar to the HIV, you know, you use the CD4 count and, and HIV viral load. Uh, please remember to screen and vaccinate for hepatitis B and HIV, HIV positive patients. I have seen uh, about once a year I see a patient who is, you know, maybe an injection drug user has HIV and, and just never uh, got vaccinated, and he could, comes down with uh, acute hep B. So lamivudine, emtricitabine, and tenofovir are duly active against HIV and hep B. So Truvada is, is typically a really good regimen in these uh, co-infected patients. And I just uh, want to remind folks of some of the excellent resources that have been developed by the Northwest AETC, including the hepatitis website. It has a lot of case-based presentations to go over these in, in uh, more depth.